Thank you. When I was five years old, I had an older brother. I mean, I still have an older brother. But when I was five, I idolized my older brother because he played ice hockey. I begged and pleaded with my parents to allow me to play ice hockey too. They finally relented and we went down to my local community center and they registered me as Sam Small. I mean, that's my name, right? There was no box to check that said male or female. When we went to my very first practice, I was just excited to be skating out on the ice. But my parents were waiting for the other little girls to show up. Like, where are all the other little girls? And gradually, some of the parents from some of the other players started to come to my parents. And they said things like, uh, girls don't play hockey. You need to take your daughter off the ice. And my parents looked back, and they're like, but why? And I think the best answer that they got was, um, well, your daughter, she can't play in the NHL. My parents were like, well, your son is five and he can't play in the NHL either. <laughs> so what's it really matter? Now, I grew up at a time when women's hockey was not an Olympic sport and it was really unacceptable for girls to play hockey. But I didn't really realize that I was different. I didn't have the realization until I was about seven years of age. And it was because my parents had shielded me from a lot of the negative comments. But when I was seven, I was playing in a game. I was a forward. I, I wanted to be a goalie, but I wasn't a goalie yet. So I was a forward. I was skating with a puck, and I was heading towards the net. And a man from the stands yells down at me at the top of his lungs as I have the puck. Hey, little girl, you belong in the kitchen. And I remember I had the puck, and I thought, is that a place on the ice I'm supposed to go? <laughs> I had no idea what he meant. And so at the end of my shift, I skated over to the player's box, and I asked my coach, I said, why was that man yelling at me to be in the kitchen? I just don't get it. And now my poor coach, an older gentleman, with tears in his eyes, looks down at me and he's like, um, I think you should ask your mother. <laughs> so that's what I did. On the drive home, I said, Mom, why was that man yelling at me the whole time to be in the kitchen? I just don't get it. And now my poor mother, with tears in her eyes, had to explain to her seven-year-old daughter that life was not fair. And it's not an easy message to get at any age, but my mom explained to me that there'd be challenges, there'd be obstacles, but that her and my dad would support me no matter what. Now, like I said, I grew up at a time when women's hockey was not an Olympic sport. So despite my passion for the game and playing boys hockey really at the highest level I could, I still played a bunch of different sports. I found myself on scholarship at Stanford University and when I, very, when, I, when I first heard that women's hockey was actually gonna be an Olympic sport, I decided to try out for the very first women's Olympic team because I'd never really given up on my passion for hockey. I ended up, I ended up making the very first team um, traveling to Nagano, Japan as a third string goalie. Now, our team had an enormous amount of pressure on us to win. This is Canada, this is hockey. Um, it's obviously our passion. Unfortunately, life, like sport, doesn't always turn out the way you want it to. We played against a really hard uh, American team in the finals. They played an amazing game, and they beat us. And it was really hard. I remember being on the blue line with my teammates, just feeling like we wanted to replay the game. They came down the, the blue line, presenting us with the silver medals. It's the last thing we wanted. Some of the girls had tears in their eyes, some of them stoically staring straight ahead. We just felt upset, we felt sad. And at a very first moment after hearing their national anthem, we left the ice, feeling like we had let <coughs> everyone down. Now, women's hockey, um, obviously for me, has been a passion my whole entire life. Um, after Nagano, um, because we went through that together as a team, it was, it was really difficult. However, the next morning, the coaches, they took us out to watch some of the other athletes at the Olympics compete. And I'm really glad they did, because in watching some of the other athletes and cheering on our Canadian athletes, we soon became really proud of our silver medals. We, be, we realized that we had a silver medal from the Olympic Games. We became so proud of it. We became proud of the work we had put in, of the effort we had put in, and how we had represented this country. So we did wear our silver medals with pride back to Canada. We landed in Canada. Front pages of the newspapers as we get off the plane reads, Team Canada is a disgrace. Team Canada has let the entire country down. 
Now, you read that stuff in the sports pages a lot, usually about your local team, maybe the Toronto Maple Leafs, but <laughs> <laughs> they said that about us. They said things like we didn't work hard enough, we didn't try hard enough, we didn't want it bad enough. I mean, who doesn't want their dream bad enough when they're so close to it? However, because we went through that together as a team, we decided for the next four years, we would do absolutely everything it took so that come Salt Lake City, we would stand up on that podium, we would have the gold medals placed around our necks, and we would finally get to hear our national anthem. Now, four years is a long time. If you think about where your life was four years ago, now think about where your life could go four years from now. Life can take so many different twists and turns along the way, but for us, we had one singular goal of winning a gold medal. For myself as a goaltender, I ended up graduating from university uh, from Stanford down in California with a degree in mechanical engineering and had to decide whether to accept a high-paying job in the Silicon Valley, like most of my classmates at the time, or move to Canada, play hockey full-time for basically no money. <laughs> Not too many people really understood my decision. However, I decided to move to Toronto and was suddenly thrust into the number one starting position as a goaltender. So I was the goalie that got to make the big saves and the big games and really got to make a difference for Canada. It was exactly where I wanted to be. I'd like to say I got there because I pushed myself and I worked really hard, which, I mean, I certainly did all of that, but it really helped that the starting goalie, um, she got pregnant. <laughs> it doesn't really happen in the NHL very often, but <laughs> it happens in women's sports. She decided to start a family, and the second goalie ended up retiring. So there I was, the starting goaltender for Canada. We ended up winning three straight world championships. So now going into Salt Lake City, we had a ton of confidence. We felt like we could beat the Americans on their home soil in front of their home crowd. How it works for hockey in this country is approximately 30 women from across the entire country are asked to move to Calgary the entire year before the Olympic Games. It's a lot to sacrifice. Uh, you're not allowed to work. You're not allowed to go to school. You have to leave your friends and family behind. But they're all choices that we were willing to make for a dream. During that year, the coaches also organized eight exhibition games for us throughout the year against our main rivals, the Americans. These were really exciting games to be a part of because we played at all the major North American rinks, and in those rinks were jammed 17,000 people yelling and screaming for women's hockey. As a little girl, I would have never imagined that that could have been possible. But despite our best efforts, we ended up losing every single game. Now, not too many people believed we could possibly win a gold medal, but we believed. People always ask me, how did you guys have so much confidence when you lost every single game all year? And I say that sometimes in failure is when you learn the most about yourself, but it's also when you learn the most about the people around you. How do they react to these situations? Do they need a shoulder to cry on? Do they need a kick in the pants? What is it they, they need to be the best players that they can be? How can I be the best teammate to the people around me? The night before the final game, the coaches sat me down. And they said to me, Sammy, we're going to be starting Kim St. Pierre, the other goaltender in tomorrow's final. And I remember staring back at the coaches in disbelief. I was in shock. My eyes were burning. I couldn't say anything. I realized my dream was over. I wasn't going to get to play. Their decision was made. I got up from that meeting with the coaches, and I just walked down into the vast Olympic village I didn't know who to turn to. Some of my best friends were on that team and I didn't want to burden them the night before the gold medal game. I just, I didn't know what to do. I was sad, I was mad, I was angry. I was everything you could possibly imagine when your dream is ripped from you right before it's about to happen. Now, hours went by, tears rolled down my face and I finally realized at two in the morning that I had two choices. One, I could feel the exact same way the next day. I don't think you become an elite athlete unless you want to be the go-to person at the go-to moment. You want to be the person taking the shootout final shot. You want to be the person in the limelight. You want to be the goalie making the big saves. However, I realized I couldn't make that choice. And I realized I couldn't make that choice because of my teammates. Because my teammates needed me to make a different choice. They needed me to make the second choice. And the second choice was to play my role to the best of my ability. 
Now, it wasn't a role I wanted to play. I mean, who knew I was training for 25 years to be the best possible cheerleader in the whole entire world, but that's what was asked of me on that day. And in life, you don't always get to choose the role you play, but you always get to choose how you play it. So the next morning, despite all those feelings inside, I put them aside and decided to be there for my teammates. It wasn't always easy. I would tell the same jokes I always told. I filled their water bottles. I tried to encourage them the best that I could. During the final game, I sat on the bench and I cheered as loud as I possibly could. And at the end of the game, the buzzer went off and I looked up and we had won. We were Olympic champions. I remember being the first one to jump over the boards, to jump on top of Kim St. Pierre, because she had really played an amazing game for us that day and really won it for us. And I remember being in the big pile up at the end and at that moment, not thinking about me, but thinking about us and how we had achieved our dream of being Olympic champions. I stood on that blue line with my, my teammates singing our national anthem, probably way, way off key. That's what we do as athletes. And they came down the line presenting some of my best friends with the gold medals. Now, they came down the line and they presented me with this gold medal. It doesn't actually come in a crown royal bag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this me medal was placed around my neck and I still, I still can't believe that it's mine, but it, um, when they put it around my neck, I realized that it didn't matter what role you played, whether you scored the big goals, or you made the big saves, or you cheered as loud as you possibly could. Each and every person got this exact same gold medal. Now, the story of my hockey, hockey career continued. I'll just put this back over here. <laughs> I had been the uh, third string goalie in Nagano. I'd been the backup goalie in Salt Lake City. So once again, I've dreamt of being that starting goaltender in Torino, Italy. Moving to Calgary the year before the Olympics in 2006, I was the height at the height of my game. I had played some big games for Canada and was in the best physical condition that I had ever been in. However, the month before the Olympic Games, the coaches once again sat me down. Never good when the coaches sit you down. And they looked at me and they said, Sammy, we want to bring you to the Olympic Games, but as a third string goalie. And I looked back at the coaches in disbelief. This wasn't fair. This wasn't the way my dream was supposed to end. And I just didn't know what to do. The coaches said to me I had two weeks to decide whether I wanted to accept the role. They knew it wouldn't be easy. Just to preface it, the third string goalie at the Olympic Games in men's hockey receives a medal for his efforts. The third string goalie in women's hockey does not receive a medal for her efforts. So I didn't know if I had the strength of character to be able to go through what I went through for one night in Salt Lake City, now for an entire month. It just hurt. I, I took my full two weeks and I really didn't know what I was gonna do. But at the end of the two weeks, I had a few of my teammates come over to my house. And they looked at me and they said, Sammy, we know you can make your own decisions in life, but we just wanted to let you know that we need you to win this gold medal. Now, whether they needed me or not, that's not the point. The point is they reached out to me in my time of need. And because of that, I wanted to reach back to them. I wanted to help them achieve their gold medal dreams. I knew it wouldn't be easy, but I decided to rejoin the team. I'd psych myself up every morning before practice, some days be the best goalie on the ice, and it wouldn't matter. I'd drive home feeling like I was cut all over again. I traveled over to Torino, Italy. I lived vicariously through my teammates, cheering on their exploits. This time, we steamrolled over the competition, playing Sweden in the final game. I cheered as loud as I possibly could during that final game, and at the end, the buzzer went off. We had won, but I still had an emptiness inside my stomach. I watched from the players' box as my teammates received their gold medals, and I just didn't know what lesson I was supposed to learn. I used to say after Salt Lake City, that each and every person got the exact same gold medal, no matter what role you played. But now I had played my role to the best of my ability, and I had nothing to show for it. I wish I could tell you I magically learned a lesson, but I didn't. It just hurt. Sometimes life is just hard. Sometimes the only thing that can help is time. I threw myself into various different projects to mask the pain. I helped start a professional women's hockey league uh, 
for myself and so my teammates would have a place to play. Despite the pain, I still love the game. I also started to do a lot more volunteer work with an organization called Right to Play. Right to Play uses sport and play as a catalyst for education in underprivileged areas around the world. But they had just started a program right here in Canada for Aboriginal youth. And I gravitated towards it, helping teach uh, hockey skills and life skills. Now, I'm not Aboriginal. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not Aboriginal. However, I do feel that Aboriginal people are the strength of this country. I've learned so much in each community that I've had the privilege of visiting. And it was on a trip to a remote northern Ontario community that I first met Janet. Now, Janet is 18. She has a daughter. She was guided down the wrong path and was recently kicked out of high school for substance abuse. But Janet was an incredibly skilled hockey player. And Janet grew up playing with her brother, just like me. Janet was smart with this quiet inner strength, and you could see her face light up when she taught others. Her brother had just recently committed suicide, but she had confided in me that she had become clean and sober for her own daughter and in order to teach others. Every day, more little girls came on the ice because Janet was there. They laughed and they giggled as they learned to skate, shoot, pass, and work with others. Most had never skated before, but Janet inspired them. She was their hero. She was quickly becoming my hero. One day I summoned enough courage to tell Janet about my pain of not receiving a gold medal at the Olympic Games. It seemed small compared to what she had gone through in her short, uh, or in her short 18 years. However, she said to me, don't diminish the pain. We must all go through tough circumstances in order to gain the strength and wisdom to teach the next generation. She had wisdom beyond her years. My mother had said a long time ago that life is not always fair. But to it, Janet added, but you can still make a difference. We can all learn from all different types of people in all different types of situations. Support is not always easy. Sometimes we have to swallow our pride in order to be there for others. But I had gained the strength to give because of the support around me. It made me realize that in the end, I was so lucky and so privileged to have been a part of such an amazing team. And the lesson I was supposed to learn was that it's not, it's not about the medal. Life is not about the reward. It's about being better today than you were yesterday. It's about being proud of what you do each and every day. And it's about being proud of the support you give to those around you. You don't always get to choose the role you play, but you always get to choose how you play it. And how you play your role really does matter, not only to yourself, but to the success of the people around you. Thank you very much.